Sup y'all, it's me, it's yo boy fanfic audiobooks, enjoy the story, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Also comment what you want to see next in the channel, let's start. Chapter 1 The Encounter Shockwaves of pure energy were sent blasting through the multiverse after the collision between the two gods. The destruction of the Infinity Gauntlet disrupted the balance of power in reality itself, altering the lives of every single thing it touched. Ripples rushed across a million different realms, dimensions, worlds, and universes, changing everyone it touched in some way. But of course, some changes are more significant than others. In one dimension, Clark Kent truly became the nerdy reporter he was always trying to be. In another a spider-themed hero was able to successfully thwart an attempt to switch his body and murder him. In a third, a demon fox overwhelmed the attempts to trap it within a child and leveled the entire village. A white-haired man and his raven-haired protégé lead the survivors on the path to rebuilding their home, eventually allowing them to become the strongest village their world had ever seen. On a fourth world, a chicken decided against crossing a road, thus eliminating an endless supply of tasteless jokes from ever existing. It is in a fifth world where this story begins. A small ten-year-old boy was trekking back towards his mountain home after managing to catch a fish large enough to be considered supper. Said fish was nearly three times the size of the ten-year-old carrying it, and had been caught while attempting to snag the child's tail. Checking the sky, the boy increased his pace slightly, wanting to be home before the full moon came out. He didn't want to accidentally run into the monster that killed his grandpa Gohan. When the boy reached his home, he set up a fire to cook the fish and went inside his small shack. The only furnishings to be found were a small bed and a shrine with an orange ball stars sitting on top of it. The four red stars gleamed on its surface in the dying daylight. The boy walked straight up to the shrine and kneeled down before the ball. Hi Grandpa, I hope you are doing all right in there. I really miss being able to talk to you. Don't worry, I'm doing all right. I even caught a really big fish today. It should keep my tummy nice and full for a whole day. I would give you some, but the last time I did that it just sat there until it went bad, so I don't think that you can eat in there. I've been practicing all of the fighting moves you've taught me, and I think I'm getting loads better. I beat up one of the dinosaurs that live in the woods this morning. The orange ball made no response, yet the boy seemed content to just continue talking. He chatted with the ball for the entire twenty minutes it took for his meal to cook, and then returned to continue telling of his day the minute he finished eating. Eventually he grew tried, and with a lazy wave the child went to bed. By the time the full moon rose above him, the young boy was sleeping soundly. In another realm a different child was staring up at the moon. The red-haired nine-year-old had just barely escaped a slave camp, where she had been forced to work from sunup to sundown every single day in an attempt to construct a magical tower. In a fit of desperation, she picked up a sword and led the prison's first and only revolt. She had nearly succeeded in freeing everyone, only to be betrayed by her best friend and made out to be the enemy. Instead of fighting their way to freedom together like she had dreamed of every night, she had been cast adrift stuck on a small boat with no guarantee of surviving back to the mainland. It had taken her more than a day to maneuver the ship back to shore safely only to find herself on a deserted beach that led into a massive forest and no sign of civilization. With no options available to her, the girl had entered the woods in an attempt to find someone that could help her. Her one good eye constantly scanned her surroundings, never letting her guard down for a second. The betrayal was still fresh in her mind, and now that she was alone there was absolutely no way she would allow herself to relax again. By the time night had come around she had already forced herself to travel nearly a dozen miles through the woods without a single break. When she had finally stopped for the night, the first thing she did was collapse onto her back. 
Halone I stared up at the sky to drink in the sight of the moon, as it cast its pale light across the forest. The sight reminded her of nights where she and her friends had gazed up at the sky from their jail cell, dreaming of freedom. Now she had finally found it, the girl wanted nothing more than to be back in the cell with the people she loved. She didn't care about being free anymore if there wasn't anyone for her to share it with. With tears trailing down her face, the girl rolled onto her side and slept. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
she doubted she would even be able to stand for the next few hours. Well damn, you're a tough bitch aren't you? The girl's eye widened in shock, as she looked up to see one of the bandits standing over her, a blue glow covering both of his hands. Too bad you didn't know that I'm a mage as well, otherwise you might have had a shot. Now though, you are at your limit and I'm going to cash you in. Mags at your age can go for quite a pretty penny. The bandit brought his hands together, the blue energy combining to form a single pulsing sphere. All right, bitch, time to go to sleep. The bandits leapt forward to strike, intent on knocking the girl out before she could recover. The red head merely closed her eye, accepting yet another miserable turn in her short life. Power pole, extend. The girl's eye snapped back open when she heard the yell, regaining her focus just in time to see a red bow staff smash into the side of her attacker's face. The man was sent sprawling backwards and the energy from his attack dispersed harmlessly back into the air. The man returned to his feet just in time to receive a flying kick to the face from a young boy with spiky black hair. The bandit was immediately knocked unconscious, the surprise attack having left him no time to defend. After a quick glance around at the other bandits, the boy turned to the young girl, offering her a hand with a wide grin. Hi. I'm Sun Goku, what's your name? The girl looked at the hand for a moment before clasping it, allowing the boy to help her to her feet. My name is Urza. Urza Scarlet. Chapter 2, Friends. Disclaimer, I own nothing. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Goku slammed the pole into the man's face, knocking him down and away from the girl. He then launched himself forward to deliver a hard kick, knocking the bandit out just as he was beginning to get up. The spiky head boy quickly glanced around at the other bandits to make sure they were out cold. He noticed one of them was still groaning, so he smacked that one on the head before turning to the red-headed girl, who was staring up at him. Goku gave the her a grin and held out his hand. Hi. I'm Son Goku, what's your name? The girl looked at his hand for a moment before clasping it, allowing the boy to help her to her feet. My name is Urza. Urza Scarlet. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
you're the only other human I've ever met. The only, you've been that isolated your whole life. Goku completely ignored her question. Instead, he was walking around the astonished girl, examining her from every angle. So do girls not have tails then? Are there other differences besides that? Urza's eyes immediately jumped to Goku's lower back, where she had finally noticed the brown monkey tail that was poking out from the top of his pants. How had she completely missed that before? Why do you have a tail? People don't have tails. Nah. All little boys have tails, they just fall off when we get older. My grandpa told me so. There is no way that's true. I've spent months with other boys our age, and none of them had tails. Urza reached out and grabbed the tail, yanking it up to her eye level to for closer examination. Goku froze, and giving a small yelp of pain he slowly fell forward, face planting on the ground. Urza blinked, not quite sure what to make of the situation. Her hand unconsciously loosened and Goku's tail slipped free, falling to the ground besides him. Goku lay unmoving for a few minutes before he finally snapped out of his pain-filled stupor and returned to his feet. Ow wow, he groaned, gently clutching his tail. That really hurt. It was weird, like all the energy in my body was being squeezed out of me. For the first time since Urza had met him, Goku wasn't smiling. He was looking at his tail like a kicked puppy, sadness etched in his features. Urza continued to watch him in silence. She was unsure of what had happened, yet she felt very much responsible for it. Goku looked up at Urza again, maintaining his shell-shocked expression. Please don't tell anyone about that. I want to be the strongest in the world like my grandpa was. If people knew about what happens with my tail, I'll never become as strong as he is. I'll never win another fight again. Urza immediately nodded her head, seeing how easily such a weakness could be used to defeat him. I am very sorry for my actions. I truly did not mean to hurt you like that. I beg your forgiveness, please strike me as punishment. Goku's attention was quickly drawn away from his tail towards the young girl. Hit you. You mean like a fight? All right, awesome. Goku instantly lashed out catching Urza off guard. The last thing she saw was a tree flying towards her head. Then there was nothing. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Grandpa always told me about a giant monster that came out on the nights of the full moon. He said I should never be outside on those nights, or he might get me. Don't tell me you actually believed him. That's the kind of stories old people tell kids to make sure they go to bed on time. Where is your grandpa? I bet if I talked to him I could get him to tell you the truth, that there is no monster. There is too a monster. You can't ask my grandpa about him because it killed him. I found him all squished up and bloody inside of a massive footprint. Urza paled at this comment, she had just insulted a dead man. Goku didn't seem to care though, as he continued speaking. He died fighting the monster so I bet he was happy. Besides, his spirit is in the dragon ball right over there. Urza looked over to where Goku had indicated and saw an orange ball with four red stars sitting on a pedestal in the back of the hut. Your grandpa's spirit is inside that thing. What is it? My grandpa told me this story a while ago, about how there are seven dragon balls and whoever can gather all seven together will be granted any wish. The disbelief on Urza's face sailed blissfully over Goku's head. He continued chatting to her about the dragon balls for several minutes, while Urza began to contemplate whether or not it would be wise for her to slip out of the house during the night. She had no idea if the boy would be willing to leave, or if he might prevent her from accomplishing her goals in some way. Goku's talking was suddenly cut off as the boy collapsed backwards, taking the young girl by surprise. He seemed to have fallen asleep in the middle of his sentence. She stared at him for a moment, checking to see if he was truly asleep. When he did not rise, Urza decided that she might as well spend the night in the hut and gather her strength. She needed to be at her best to complete her journey safely. She had made a promise, and she was planning on keeping it. Tomorrow, she would continue her search for fairy tale. Chapter 3 The Living Weapon Goku's first night in Earthland didn't pass smoothly for him. He had been snapped awake shortly after Urza drifted off. Something was wrong. There were many things about this new place that he found odd. He couldn't hear the mountain winds blowing, the food tasted different, even the air tasted slightly different. He decided that before he tried going back to sleep, he should take a walk. After checking out the window to see if the moon was full, which it wasn't, he made his way towards the door. Looking over at the redhead to make sure she was asleep, Goku edged his way out of the cabin. He truly had no idea what was going on, and as the excitement of meeting someone new began to fade away, a worrying feeling replaced it. Where exactly had he ended up? What was that giant flash of light? How had he gotten here? Goku stopped to consider everything that had happened, attempting to make heads or tails of his situation. After a few minutes, he just shrugged. He had no clue, so there was no point worrying about it. He had always been quick to adapt, he had figured out how to care for himself very quickly after Grandpa Gohan had passed away. This wasn't too different, he just needed to adapt to a new living area this time. If anything, things were even better now. He had gotten into a fight almost as soon as he had arrived, even though it wasn't a very good one, and he had made a new friend. His very first friend. Smiling at that thought, Goku returned inside and laid down next to Urza, quickly. Returning to his slumber. Almost immediately the boy's mind was assaulted by strange dreams. The boy dreamed of a blue-haired woman and a talking pig, traveling with him across the mountains on an adventure. On their adventure they found a large sea turtle that asked them to return it to the ocean. He dreamed of an ancient man with a turtle shell on his back, yelling something as he fired a blue beam of pure energy. Goku marveled at the attack, never before in his life had he seen anything quite so powerful. The beam hit a flaming mountain, reducing it to rubble. Goku just had to know this technique, it was the coolest thing he had ever seen in his entire life. The dream flashed forwards, this time showing Goku. Goku cried in the same technique as the old man and fired his own version of the attack. While it was far smaller, 
it was still able to destroy the blue-haired woman's bike thing like it was cardboard. Still though, Goku's subconscious refused to let him hear the name. The move appeared again and again, flashing through decades of time, showing Goku grow tall and powerful and using that technique to win dozens of battles. Then he was back at the mountain and the old man was speaking to him again. He called the technique the Turtle Destruction Wave, but that wasn't the name he had cried out. The man's muscles bulged, and he cupped his hands close to his side as he chanted. Ka. Me. Boom. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The bandit fell over and gave Urza a clean shot at his head. The girl liberated the man's short sword from his unconscious body, and within minutes her twin blades had slashed their way through more than half of the slaver's numbers. Dilvak had backed off the second his comrades started falling, watching the battle from a distance. He raised his arms and smirked, his palms aglow with magical power, and aimed straight at Urza. The girl was focused on parrying the attacks of three men that had cornered her near the door to Goku's cabin, leaving her completely unaware of the true threat. Try this bitch. Blaster cannon. Urza had knocked down the very last of the men just as Dilvak's shout reached her ears. She turned just in time to see a glowing orange cannonball heading straight for her face. Kia. Urza shrieked as she threw herself to the side to avoid the blast. The attack kept going, and Urza watched in horror as it struck Goku's house and detonated. Boom. The front wall of the building was gone, leaving the remains of the house to collapse in on itself in a giant pile of splinters and stone. Urza stared in shock at the wreck, stared at the spot where she knew her friend was crushed beneath. No. Urza whipped around to face Dilvak, sparks of rage dancing across her eyes, and tears streaming down her face. Hey! Who blew up Grandpa's house? Urza and Dilvak looked back towards the house in disbelief. Pushing his way out of the ruins was none other than Goku, not a single scratch on his body. The power pole was clutched tightly in his hand, and his eyes were hard with anger as he glared at Dilvak. It was you, wasn't it? You tried to hurt Urza, and now you've gone and blown up Grandpa's house. You are very a bad person. I think I'm going to hit you now. Dilvak chose not to waste time, raising his arms once more. Blaster cannon. Goku stood his ground and raised the power pole like a baseball bat. Urza bit back a yell, she wanted to tell him to dodge it. However, the look on his face and the easiness he sank into his fighting stance told her that he'd been in this situation before. She decided to trust his judgment. Ha! Huh. Goku swung the staff with all of his strength, the magical weapon smacking the magic energy ball away, aimed right back towards its source. Dilvak had just enough time to widen his eyes with shock before the blast smashed into his stomach. The man let out a grunt of pain, as he was thrown into one of the trees. The thick trunk shattered on the impact, and Dilvak slid to the ground unconscious. Urza walked over to him, checking for any signs that he was still a threat. Finding none, she slammed her heel down onto his crotch, a smirk on her face. You should have learned the first time, I will never be a slave. Never again. Urza walked back towards Goku, looking to him with amusement, as he went around poking the men she had taken down with his staff. Finding none of them awake to entertain him, Goku wandered back over to the ruins of his home, digging around in the rubble until he pulled out the four-star dragon ball. I am most disappointed. The two kids turned around to see the nearly forgotten leader rising from his boulder. I expected my men to be capable of defeating you. Instead though, now you shall face Ajax the armor. At the man's cry his muscles swelled, bulging out even more ridiculously, a silver liquid pouring out from his skin, covering him completely. The liquid solidified over every part of his body, encasing him in a suit of quicksilver armor. Spikes and blades appeared all over him, even the inside of his mouth turned metallic, his teeth sharpening like those of a shark. Goku held his staff at the ready, and Urza brought both of her liberated blades to bear. For a moment, none of them moved, each side trying to find the perfect moment to strike. Then they began. Urza closed in first, lashing out with her blades towards the man's chest. The sharp steel impacted with the man's strange metal, leaving deep grooves on its surface. Ajax countered, growing a massive scythe-like blade from his elbow and slashing it towards the girl. Urza hopped out of the way and Goku took her place, blocking the blade with his staff. He expertly swung it sideways, knocking the dark mage off balance and landing a powerful downward strike to his head. The staff bounced off Ajax's armor uselessly, 
and the metal man punted Goku across the clearing. As he straightened, the cuts across his chest sealed themselves, leaving his armor shiny and unmarked once more. Ajax charged forwards, slashing out with a flurry of blades towards both kids with a wild abandon. Urza parried the attacks with a mastery that didn't befit her age, gracefully dodging and countering at every move. Goku lacked the same experience with weapons, but he was also able to hold his own. He ducked underneath a slash at his neck and swung his staff wildly in an attempt to fend the metal man off. Ajax was not a skilled fighter, but he didn't need to be. His regenerating armor and his incredible brute strength had always overpowered his more skilled opponents. This fight was no exception. Neither of the kids were a match for the muscle giant, they couldn't get through his armor, and they weren't strong enough to overpower him. Goku mistimed a block and received a small gash across his chest for his trouble. He gritted his teeth at the sudden pain, using it to motivate himself to take the offensive. Goku dodged underneath the next slash and swung upwards with the power pole, catching the man under the chin. Power pole extend. With the staff still lodged under his neck, Ajax suddenly found himself being lifted far above the clearing. Then just as fast as it extend, the weapon shrunk back to its normal size, allowing the giant man to fall to the ground and smash down on top of one of the bushes. Goku grinned in victory at the move, until Urza suddenly smacked him upside the head. Ow! What was that for? Goku pouted at her. You idiot! You just launched him onto the plant that grew the magic beans. He flattened it. Now we can't use them to heal ourselves anymore. Oh, he he my bad. The kids watched from a distance as Ajax picked himself up, his armor unmarked once more. The man's right arm suddenly shifted, extending outwards and sharpening into a massive broadsword. His other arm morphed as well, extending outwards into what appeared to be a giant crossbow except it lacked any sort of string. The man's eyes were focused solely on Goku. He seemed to be completely ignoring everything else, including Urza, as she charged forwards and swung both of her blades at his face. The swords created sparks from the force of the impact, but this time there was no visible damage on the armor. Instead, both of Urza's blades shattered, the shards of the weapons falling to the ground in an arc of sparkling fragments. Urza looked down in shock at the useless handles of her swords. Smirking at her, Ajax smashed his foot into her chest with an audible crack, sending the redhead hurtling into a tree. Urza. Goku attempted to go aid his friend, but was halted as a giant metal crossbow bolt slammed down in front of him. Ajax was transforming his armor into projectiles, shooting arrows of quicksilver at the boy. Ajax began firing the bolts at a rapid rate, gradually increasing his speed to keep his target off balance. Goku deflected the first few shots with his staff, but the rate of fire continued to increase, and soon he found himself backing up in an attempt to increase the time between shots. Seeing Goku's tactic of retreat, Ajax doubled his shooting speed. Goku dived sideways to avoid a shot that would have impaled him, and rolled out of the way of another that pierced the spot he landed. Goku was on his feet a second later, but it was too slow. The metal bolt in front of him suddenly transformed, shifting itself into a massive hand that seized him by the leg. Goku struggled with all his might, but nothing he did could get him loose from the trap. Ajax transformed both of his arms back to their normal metallic look and walked over, analyzing the boy in front of him. The boy, has a flaw, would make him harder to sell. Remove the flaw, fix the problem. Just have to, cut it off. Ajax grabbed Goku by the hair, turning him around to look at the tail on Goku's back. Then in a swift movement, he chopped it right off. Wah! Goku let out a cry of pain as the limb fell to the ground. The tail twitched wildly as it suddenly died, leaving nothing but a tiny stump on Goku's back. A metallic fist crashed into Goku's jaw, slamming his mouth shut and knocking him to the ground. Ajax towered over his prone body, chuckling quietly to himself as Goku tried to get back up. 
The bandit shifted his arm into a giant clamp, latching onto the boy so he could carry him back to his base. Now all he had to do was figure out where the girl had landed. Higher. The giant man was knocked sideways as Urza smashed a massive mace into the side of his head. The young girl quickly dragged the groggy Goku away from him, clutching her ribs in pain as she moved. Goku sat up a moment later, rising shakily to his feet as he tried to get used to his new sense of balance. Only silly children keep fighting when they are outmatched, they don't realize they cannot win against a living weapon. A living weapon, oh. Urza stood up and stared at him for a moment. Then she smirked, a dangerous light appearing in her eyes. Ajax cocked an eyebrow at the redhead, not realizing what she was thinking. I only recently discovered my magic, but I do understand it. I can control weapons with my mind. Do you know what that means, Mr. Weapon? Urza flicked her hands out, and suddenly Ajax staggered. Backward. He looked down to see his bare chest instead of armor. He quickly resealed the gap, but the damage was done. Goku, I'll punch holes in his armor, you punch him. Goku nodded in understanding and darted forwards, dodging around Ajax's attacks and waiting for an opening. The metal-clad giant swung his sword forward, but Urza flicked it aside, creating another gap in the process. The power pole slammed into the gap, cracking ribs and forcing a dribble of blood out of the bandit's mouth. Urza struck again, this time leaving Ajax's head exposed. He desperately threw up his arms to block the rapid attacks of the young boy, stopping the staff and kicking out wildly to knock him to the ground. The bandit spun on his feet, turning from his downed opponent and charging towards the true threat, the child that had somehow found a weakness in his impenetrable defense. Urza allowed him to get two steps closer before she unleashed all of her remaining power at him. Ajax suddenly found himself flying upwards in the air, a purple aura surrounding him. Then the girl slammed him down, creating a massive crater in the ground as he impacted. Then she lifted him back up and did it again. And again. And again. And again. And again. Ajax's armor was in shambles, most of it destroyed and the remnants were left hanging uselessly off of his body. The man was barely conscious, his body covered in massive bruises and one of his arms hanging at an awkward angle, broken and useless. With a final cry of determination Urza launched him off towards the horizon, watching with no small amount of satisfaction, as he disappeared into the sky with a small flash of light. Goku stared at the redhead with stars in his eyes. That was so cool. Can you teach me how to do that, you threw him all over the place. Urza smiled at him tiredly, silently questioning how he still had so much energy. Sorry, I barely understand how my powers work myself. That's one of the main reasons I'm traveling right now, I'm trying to get to a place called Fairy Tail. I was told that if I can get there that I would meet people who could train me and help me get stronger. Really? You get to go and meet a whole bunch of really strong people and train with them. That's awesome. Yes, um, Urza looked over at the remains of Goku's home, guilt weighing heavy on her heart. If he hadn't gotten involved with her, it would still be standing. I don't suppose, maybe you would like to come with me. Your house got destroyed in the fight, you need somewhere to live now. Goku looked over at the building, then he pulled the dragon ball out of his pocket, looking at it cheerfully. I still have grandpa with me so it's no problem. I can rebuild the house really quick. But are those people at Fairy Tale all strong like you? Yes, I believe that they are. So would you like to come along? Yeah, of course. Oh boy, this will be awesome. I can meet a whole bunch of really strong people and get more powerful, just like I told Grandpa. Can I really come with you? Urza chuckled to herself at the boy's antics abruptly coughing as her broken rib protested the action. The girl's eyes hardened, clenching her chest as she tried to stop herself from showing any signs that she was still in pain. She failed miserably. Goku watched his friend with concern, 
her pain still evident on her face despite her attempts to conceal it. He reached into his pocket once more and pulled out a sole green bean. He held out his hand, offering it to her. Urza looked past him, noticing that he still lacked his tail. Do you have another one for yourself? If not you should take it, my injuries will heal with time. You had your tail chopped off, you need it more. Goku shook his head, still holding out the bean. Now, nah, I'm pretty sure it will grow back. But when we get to fairy tail you said we could train with a bunch of really strong people, you can't train with them if you're all beat up. Urza glared at the boy, but when it became apparent that he wouldn't back down her gaze softened. She quietly took the bean, sighing in relief as she felt her ribs heal. The two spent some time preparing, Urza collecting several of the bandits' weapons that she liked the feel of, and Goku catching them some food for the road. With their weapons set, bags of food on their backs, and the dragon ball secure in Goku's pocket, the pair set off. They left behind them the ruins of Goku's hut in the forest, setting out towards what they hoped would be their new home. This is going to be so cool, I can't wait to fight a whole bunch of really powerful people. Let's get to fairy tale quick. Chapter 4, Welcome to Fairy Tale For all of his power, Urza just could not believe just how utterly clueless Goku was. How he had managed to walk off the edge of a cliff was just completely beyond her. Dumbfounded, she just watched as he pulled his head out of the hole and climbed back up. He just started walking again, forcing Urza to jog after him as the boy rambled on about how different life was without a tail. Their duo had been on the road for a week now, and Urza was still unsure just what she thought of her new friend. He wasn't a complete idiot, he wouldn't have been able to survive alone for as long as he did otherwise. But his simple, scatterbrained nature left her wondering how he ever got anything done. One minute he would be walking along besides her, the next he would be up in a tree trying to find fruit. A second after that he would be chasing a squirrel around in an attempt to get it to play with him. The first few times he had done this Urza had smacked him upside the head to try and get him to stop. He thought this meant she was challenging her to a fight. After leaving several Urza-shaped imprints in the ground, she figured it would be better for her health to just let him be. Goku was completely oblivious to Urza's confusion. For the first time in his life he was traveling, getting to see more of the world than just the small portion he had grown up in. In just a few short days he had already wrestled a bear, played fetch with a wolf pack, and had gotten to spar with Urza a whole bunch of times. He hadn't had so much fun since his grandpa had died. The pair hadn't had any trouble since defeating Ajax. The only thing unusual was that he'd continued to have those strange dreams. However, they were gradually becoming less frequent as he became more acquainted with his new surroundings. As though whatever was giving him these dreams was getting further and further away. The sun was just starting to set when they first caught sight of a city in the distance. Urza allowed herself a small smile as they looked down from the mountain pass, she could finally see the guild that Rob told her about so many times before. A great building proudly displaying the symbol Rob had on his back. Goku's face split into a massive grin, as he took in the smell of all of the different foods that was drifting upwards with the wind. As one, the pair broke into a run. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
The brunette was glaring daggers at the nearly naked ice mage as they searched, annoyed that she had been dragged away from a hot meal before even getting the chance to touch it. Gray was indifferent to her anger, instead he was poking around a stack of barrels, hoping to get a glimpse of his wayward garments. Hey! I am doing you a favor, it's rude to not say anything when someone is talking to you. Yeah, whatever. I don't know what happens, one moment my clothes are there, the next they just disappear. That's not what happens. You just strip them off and throw them wherever. I do not. They just disappear when I'm not paying attention. I can't believe how big of a moron you are. What? My clothes just disappear all by themselves. How the heck does that make me a moron? Kana was about to respond, but her carefully constructed rant on just how stupid he was got interrupted when a crumpled piece of fabric caught her eye. Aren't those your pants over there? Finally. Good eye. Gray dodged around some of the other guild members and grabbed the pants, quickly pulling them onto his fellow mag's amusement. Once they were on and buttoned, Gray looked down, hoping to find his shirt. My shirt's not here. We are going to have to keep searching. No way, I paid for that food over there and I'm going to eat it before it gets cold. What's wrong with cold food? Says the ice mage. What has that got to do with anything? Ice mags like everything cold, normal people actually enjoy it when their meals don't freeze their insides on the way down. Now you are going to go over there and sit with me while I eat, or you are going to have to buy me another plate. The two children glared at each other for several moments, their eyes locked, waiting for the other to cave. Gray broke first. Fine, you can eat your stupid food before we go try and find my shirt. But if my pants disappear again while you're eating, you have to help me find those too. Kana just rolled her eyes, smirking at her victory. Deal. The pair sat down at Kana's empty table near the middle of the room, Gray grumbling to himself as he craned his head around, still trying to find his clothes. Kana just munched on her food quietly trying to work out just how someone could manage to be as dense as the ice mage. He had to be the dumbest person she knew. It was at that moment that the doors to the guild opened, drawing the attention of the pair out of their inner musing and towards the strange pair that were walking through the entrance. The first was a girl with startlingly red hair. Her clothing was little more than rags, frayed and looking as though they could fall apart at any moment. She had a small bag slung over one shoulder, and a worn iron blade over the other. She was gazing around the guild, scanning each and every face, as she walked forward. Her expression was hard, as though she was preparing herself for a fight. The boy with her was the complete opposite. It was a wonder how he didn't get whiplash with how quickly he kept turning his neck, trying to take everything in at once. His eyes were wide with wonder, and a giant grin split his face. A small red staff was sheathed on his back, covered by a backpack slightly larger than the girl's. The two stopped once they reached the center of the guild, the girl positioned slightly ahead of the boy. Kana looked her over and noticed a slight tremor in the redhead's hand. She was nervous about something. Hello, we are looking for Master Makarov. Is he here? The girl's voice lacked any of the nervousness that her body betrayed, she sounded cool, calm and collected. The guild members regarded her for a moment, then Gray slid off of his chair and stepped forwards. Why are you looking for the old man? I was sent here by an old friend of his, he told me to talk to the master and see about joining this guild. You want to join Fairy Tale? If an old friend of the master sent you, why are you dressed up like you just broke out of an orphanage? That is none of your business, and you would do well to not question me about it. Gray saw the look of anger in the girl's eyes and backpedaled. If she really had been sent by a friend of Makarov's, then it would be a good idea not to insult her. You said that he sent you here. What about him? The girl looked over to see her spiky-haired companion staring up at the ceiling. After delivering a sharp elbow to his gut, she turned back to Gray. 
I got into some trouble on my way here, and he saved my life. His helping me cost him his home, so I asked him to come along with me. Gray opened his mouth to reply, but he was interrupted by a deeper voice behind him. I'm sure that's quite an interesting story, but it seems Gray has forgotten to ask you one of the most important questions. What are your names? The girl looked over at the short man that had appeared on top of the bar, carefully regarding him before responding. I'm Urza Scarlet. My companion over there is named Goku. Said boy had wandered off and began exploring the building during the conversation, but out the sound of his name he turned to give the little man a wave and a big smile. The old man looked at the pair for a moment before letting out a quiet chuckle. I am Fairy Tales Guild Master, Makarov. Tell me, young one, who is this friend you spoke of that sent you to me? An old man named Rob. He helped me out, and it's because of him that I first discovered how to access my magic. Makarov froze at the name. Rob? I haven't heard from him in years. Tell me, child, where is he now? He, he passed away far from here. He told me that I needed training in my magic, and that this is the best place for me to go. Makarov closed his eyes, clearly stricken by the news. I see. He sighed. That sounds like something Rob would say, very well child, I would be more than happy to welcome you both to fairy tale. Urza's guarded expression cracked, and a look of genuine relief and happiness swept over her face. The redhead looked around the room to see her friend's expression, then suddenly froze. The sound of her palm smacking her forehead could be heard throughout the hall. Look Urza, I'm a ninja. The assembled guild members turned to look at the young child, and for a brief moment a complete silence settled over the hall. Then almost everyone in the building broke out in laughter. Goku was standing on top of a table in the corner of the room, a black shirt tied around his head like a mask. Kana took all of a second to figure out where the shirt had come from, and the next second had her rolling around on the ground in a fit of giggles. Gray stared at the young boy, his fists slowly tightening. His face was slowly turning red, and a burning rage filled his eyes. That's my shirt you idiot. Give it back right now. Goku looked over at the boy, pulling the shirt off of his head and grasping it in one hand. Well why did you take it off? I didn't. It just disappeared. How did it disappear? I don't know how it disappeared, it just vanished when I wasn't paying attention. So you didn't notice that your shirt was gone? I noticed. That's why I was. Looking for it. You weren't looking for it, you were sitting at the table. I was taking a break. You got tired looking building for your shirt. It's not very big, you must not have a lot of energy if you get tired that quickly. Gray's face now resembled a tomato, and Kana was struggling to remember how to breathe from her position on the floor. You, you. I'm gonna tear you apart. Gray rushed forward his fist cocked back, his rage leaving him blind to anything besides the confused-looking boy before him. His charge was halted by the quick appearance of Urza's fist. Gray went flying sideways and crashed into a pillar, slowly sliding down it and landing on the ground with a thud. See, I thought he was weak. Urza let out a snort, then a chuckle, and then she was just laughing at her friend. Goku looked from the stunned Grey to her, and started laughing too. That, that was a cheap shot. I wasn't even going for you. Grey had one hand clutching a large bump on his head, and the other pointing an accusing finger at Urza. The happiness instantly left her face, and she turned to face Grey with cold eyes. I regard any attack on my friends as an attack on myself, and I respond accordingly. Goku hopped over some tables and landed next to Grey, handing him the shirt. It's not that big a deal being weak, it just means that you need to train a whole bunch so you'll get really strong. I want to get really strong, just like Grandpa wanted me to. If you want, I'll train with you, we can get stronger together. Gray's eyes narrowed and he rose to his feet. I am not weak, and I'll prove it. 
Fight me, right now. Goku saw the hard determination in the boy's eyes, and he had only one response. Do I have to take my pants off too? Startled, Grey looked down and discovered that his pants had once again vanished. Damn it. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
What are you freaking out for? A A R U J J joking. I I T S. He even called a T H than the T T time that Grandpa P P pushed me I I into a G G glacier. Kana was the first to decipher Goku's reply through his shivering, prompting her to ask, "Where did your Grandpa find a glacier to push you into?" Goku took a moment before responding, sighing in relief as he managed to return feeling to his numb limbs. Well. Grandpa wanted ice one day, so he told me to wait for him at the house while he went north for a few days. When he came back, he was carrying a big glacier. It was three times the size of our house. He asked me if I wanted to see it up close, and when I said yes, he threw me into it. Kana opened her mouth to respond, then closed it. She tried to talk again, but was unable to think of an appropriate response. Gray saved her the trouble. Hey, are we fighting or not? Come on, it was just getting interesting. As Gray talked, he casually lifted his shirt off his chest, bringing out a series of happy cheers and disappointed muttering throughout the assemble mags. Kana barely managed to contain a triumphant cheer as Gray's pants followed his shirt. Her wallet was getting fat tonight. Oh yeah, sorry I got distracted. Here we go. Goku leapt forwards. Catching the annoyed Ice Mage by surprise, Gray's head snapped back as Goku's fist connected with his face, sending him tumbling backwards. Before Goku could press his advantage, Gray rolled to his feet, his magic flaring to life around him. Ice Mage Cannon. Goku's power pole was in his hands in an instant, swinging through the air to connect with the attack like a baseball bat. The chunk of ice went flying off towards the crowd. Slamming into a bored-looking blonde teen and sending him to the ground. A few of the girls snickered as the boy spat out grass from his unplanned trip downwards. Across the circle, Makarov sighed. There was no way his grandson would let that go. Gray snarled in frustration as Goku dodged two more cannon blasts. The smaller boy was just too nimble to hit unless he was caught off guard. Switching tactics. Gray dissolved his cannon and raised his arm into the air. Ice make sword. An icy blade sprang into existence, a faint mist radiating off its entire length. Let's see how well you fight if that stupid stick of yours gets chopped to bits. The two boys charged in, throwing all of their power into their attacks. The power pole blocked the momentum of the blade, then swung upward, knocking the icy sword sideways. Gray quickly brought it back up, deflecting a jab that would have caught his gut and swung the sword out towards Goku's chest. The spiky-haired boy deflected the blow and then swung downward straight towards the blade's hilt. Gray's eyes widened in shock as the sword shattered, sending shards of ice flying in every direction. He quickly threw out his hand, sending a burst of ice to spread out along the power pole's length. Goku quickly released his weapon and jumped upwards. Spinning over Gray's head and landing back to back with him, simultaneously they swung around to face each other, fists clenched and determination in their eyes. As their fists collided together, Goku let out a cry of "Rock!" He dodged under Gray's next punch and lunged, jabbed his hand towards the Ice Mage's face with two fingers extended. Scissors. Gray let out a cry of pain as Goku's fingers jabbed into his eyes. Sending him stumbling backwards, the ice mage desperately rubbed at his eyes, trying to restore his vision. Goku stiffened his hand, launched a powerful palm strike straight for Gray's forehead. Paper. Gray's blurry eyes were just able to see the outline of Goku's hand before the blow struck. Then everything went dark. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Gray woke up hours later on a bed in Fairy Tail's medical room. He slowly slid off the bed and eased his way to the floor. His head was throbbing from Goku's last attack, and his sense of balance was still shaky. He carefully made his way out towards the main room and saw a crowd surrounding the bar. Standing on top were Goku, Urza, and Makarov. 
Gray watched as Makarov presented the pair with the fairy tale symbol, placing it on Urza's left upper arm and Goku's right shoulder. There was a round of applause from the crowd, and both kids smiled towards the group. It was several minutes before Goku noticed Gray standing across the room, and the second he saw the ice mage the young boy's face lit up in a massive grin. He leapt straight over the crowd and dashed over to Gray's side. That was such a good fight. Your powers are really funny though, Grandpa never showed me anything like them. You are so much stronger than I thought, we have to spar more later. Gray stared at Goku for a moment, thinking briefly that he should really dislike the kid for beating him. But Goku's happy attitude was contagious, and soon Gray found himself grinning right back at him. All right, we can fight again, but you better be ready because next time you're the one who is going to end up in the hospital. Goku laughed and turned back towards the group, looking for either Urza or food, whichever he could find first. Before he get far, Gray reached out and tapped his shoulder. Goku looked back and saw his new friend looking somewhat hesitant. Hey Goku. Yeah? Have you seen my clothes? Chapter 5 A Fierce Rivalry Goku grit his teeth, struggling with all his might as he stared down his latest foe. A is for AP Apple Lee. Goku read off the small children's book that was challenging him with its colorful pictures and difficult words. His struggle had begun when Urza had learned that he had absolutely no ability to read. Urza had declared that this was a critical skill for any mage and that he would learn to do so. The young knight had dragged him to the guild library to try and teach him herself. This plan had not worked, it turned out Urza did not possess much skill in reading herself, the Tower of Heaven being largely ineffective at providing children with an education. What she had learned prior to being captured had begun to fade away, and she was left struggling with her incomplete recollection. They had almost gotten through the alphabet before Goku decided that he was bored, and that the food the guild was serving looked much more entertaining. The subsequent argument had drawn the attention of the only other person in the library. A short, blue-haired girl, looking about a year or two younger than them had come over and introduced herself as Levi McGarden. Then she asked if they needed help. I am trying to teach this scatterbrained idiot how to read. Hey don't blame me, reading and words are boring. I already told you that being able to read is a critical skill. Why? I can't punch people with words. Actually Goku. Levi had interjected, words can actually be quite powerful. Powerful, that had gotten his attention. Yes. Using the power in words is actually the foundation of my magic. So you actually punch people with words? Um, not really, here let me show you. The girl smiled and waved her hands in the air a word appeared in the air, which then shifted into a ball of light. Illuminating the shelves around them with a soft glow. My magic is all about language and words. The word I wrote was the word for light so that's the form my magic took. Now watch what happens when I combine it with the word for dance. She waved her hand again another word appear, and was sucked into the glowing ball. Which began to zoom around the room, bouncing off of books and shimmying up the side of bookcases. By understanding words, and what they mean I can create almost any kind of effect I want. Cool. So you can make anything you want, even food. Well, yes I can, but the magically created food is never as tasty or as filling as real food, it just tends to be empty calories. But, if you learn how to read then you can read menus at restaurants. It will be easier for you to get food that way. So I can get more food if I learn how to read. Well, that does sound good, but it's still a lot of work. Well, how about we play a game with it? I can use my magic to make some of the things you are reading, help make things interesting. That sounds really cool. Could you make a dinosaurs like the ones back by my home, they are really fun to play with, and they taste really good. Dinosaurs? Levi blinked. Where did you say you come from? The mountain. 
anyway, I can't really make big things like that. What I can make is limited to how much energy I have. I'm not very strong, so I can't really make big objects. She waved her hands to demonstrate. A word formed in the air before forming into a bunny-sized T-Rex that gave a squeaky roar and started chasing the ball of light around the table. That sounds fun. Why don't we make it a trade? You teach me how to read, and I help you train and get stronger. Really? That sounds great, they shook hands to seal the deal. So how far have you gotten? We had just gotten the letter W, said Urza. Why is it called W, when it looks like 2 VS? Shouldn't it be called double V? Be quiet, Goku. Urza smiled as Goku slowly continued to work through new words. When he finally was able to piece together, Apple Levi magically created a few of the red fruits, and the trio enjoyed enjoyed a brief snack break. They ate in silence while watching the antics of Levi's tiny T-Rex. The mini dinosaur had finally caught the ball of light and eaten it, only for the magic of the light to combine with it, causing the lizard to start glowing and moonwalking across the table. When the food was finished, Boza excused herself, leaving the two to their reading lesson she made her way towards the main doors. The red-haired girl left the guild and began strolling down the street. As she walked, the smile began to fade from her face. She kept walking for several minutes, finally stopping when she reached the riverbank right on the edge of the town. She slowly sat down, curling up into herself, gazing down into the running water. When she had been on the road, she had bottled everything up, first focusing on survival, then helping her friend. When she was in the guild she just hid how she felt. She didn't want to give anyone any reason to ask about her past. Goku was naive enough not to question the condition he found her in, and probably didn't even consider it important enough to bother mentioning to anyone else. But every once in a while, she just needed to find time to be alone. Time to stop holding back, and just let everything go. Her eyes watered as she thought back to the events at the tower, back to Jell's betrayal, and the look on the faces of her friends, as she was forced to leave them behind to save their lives. Those looks stayed with her, keeping her up at night and haunting her during the day. For the third time since joining the guild months ago, Urza cried. It was another ten minutes before she collected herself, forcing herself to her feet once more. The mask of calm returned, and the young girl began making her way back towards the guild. As much as it hurt, and as much as she hated herself for not getting the rest of the slave workers out of the tower, she would not allow it to affect her new life. She would mourn her friends, but she would not let her grief control her. There was little she could do to help them. She had new friends now, new people to care about. A new home. No matter what, she would not allow herself to fail twice. She just couldn't. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Kana stood just besides them, shocked at how easily Grey had been defeated. Her hands slowly reached towards her pack of cards, hoping to be able to help her friend. Unless you want to join your buddy on the ground, I really wouldn't do that. Kana's eyes widened with fear as the girl turned to glare at her, shivering under the killing intent. Lee's Anna stepped forward, placing herself between the scared girl and her sister's wrath. Come on Myra Jane, big sis, we want to join up with them, not beat the entire guild into submission. But I bet it will be a lot easier for us once everyone knows that we are the top dogs. But speaking of joining up, where do you suppose the guild master is hanging out? I want to get my mark, I already know just where I want to put it. Below her, Grey was slowly trying to push himself up, his body shaking from the exertion. Myra Jane felt the movement below her and ground in her heel. Just give it up down there, it's obvious that you're outmatched. Maybe if you ask real nice I'll let you up. I think you should let him up right now. The three white-haired kids turned to see Goku and Levi exiting the library. Levi backed away, anxiously looking at the growing confrontation, but Goku's face was completely impassive. His eyes were locked with Mira Jane's completely unflinching as he stared her down. The girl matched his gaze evenly, then barked out a laugh. Oh, another. Weakling crawling out of the woodworks. Come on short stuff, I've already beaten your buddy, what makes you think you'll do any better? To her surprise, Grey was the one to answer with a laugh of his own. He'll do better, he beat me too. He's strong enough to beat you too. Myra looked over the spiky-haired boy with a critical eye, observing his build, his stance, his posture, and the challenge that seemed to blaze in his eyes. Yeah, I don't buy it. He looks like a complete wimp, and that look on his face makes him look like a complete moron. Bet that's why you were hanging out with that little nerdy girl hanging out behind you, taking some remedial lessons. I was learning how to read. Learning how to. Ogies, you really are a complete idiot, aren't you? This won't even be a fight, it's a mercy beating. Maybe if I smack you around hard enough, I'll be able to knock something loose in your head. You would do well to stop harming and insulting my friends, before I am forced to make you stop myself. Myra Jane rolled her eyes as she tilted her head to face the entrance of the guild. You guys are just crawling out of the woodworks now, huh? And a ginger this time, fun. I have to ask though, what's with the armor? Are you that desperate to hide your body from everyone, you so ugly that you don't want to give anyone a good look? As opposed to you dressing up wearing your little sister's shirt. In case you are too dim to figure it out on your own, that shirt doesn't fit you. Hey! Who do you think you are, talking to me like that? My name is Urza Scarlet, and I will not stand for you doing anything to my friends. Myra Jane looked down at Grey, then with a sneer on her face she released him, marching over to get right up in Urza's face. Got pretty pathetic friends, for them to have to rely someone like you to stand up for them. Between the wimpy snowman and your brain-dead boyfriend, a wannabe Amazon must get the leadership pretty easy. She turned to look over at Goku, who had dashed over to help Grey to his feet. What do you think, dumbass? Why are you following around the tin can? Is it just because you are too dumb to know any better? Or maybe you are hoping for some future development with her, hmm? Goku ignored her for a moment, handing Grey off to Kana to make sure that he was taken care of. Then he turned to face her, his expression hard. I may not be very smart, I don't even understand everything you just said. But I don't like people who mock my friends. You may be stronger than everyone else in the guild, you may not be, but everyone here is my friend. If you are joining the guild, then you three are going to be our friends too, so you shouldn't act like this. Why don't you just calm down, and we can go find Master Makarov so you guys can join. Are you kidding me? Why should I be friends with you guys, just like that? You want to be friends, you have to earn it. Right now all I see is a bunch of losers who aren't even worth it. Goku opened his mouth to reply, 
but before he had a chance to say anything, Urza moved. Goku had extended an olive branch, and this little which had thrown it right back in his face, that was unacceptable. With a growl she grabbed Mirajane's shoulders, spinning her around so they were face to face. Enough. I will not allow you to speak like this any longer. If you want me to stop so bad, make me. If you insist. Urza's armored fist slammed Mirajane's jaw, sending her tumbling to the ground with a resounding clang. The white-haired mage quickly rolled to her feet, charging forwards and decking Urza with equal force. Myra chased after Urza as she tumbled backwards, kicking out at the red head. Urza brought up a gauntlet-covered arm to block the blow, smirking at Mirajane's curses when her toes smashed up against the unyielding metal. The enraged girl was quick to retaliate, knocking the swordswoman's legs out from under her and then falling on top of her, pinning her to the ground. Before Urza could shake her off, Myra began pounding on her, forcing the red head to throw her arms up in a desperate attempt to protect her head. Power pole, extend. Myra let out a surprised yelp as the magical red staff slammed into her side, knocking her off of Urza and slamming her into the wall. Urza was quick to return to her feet, turning to glare at Goku. Do not interfere. But you were in trouble, I was helping out. I do not want help. This is my fight, let me do this on my own. Myra Jane rose to her feet, glaring angrily at the martial artist. You heard her, this is a one-on-one. -on -one. But out. Go play with your loser friends or something, this is none of your business. Goku looked between the two girls and nodded, backing out of the way. Urza gave a nod of appreciation, grabbed a nearby chair, and spun around to smash it over Mirajane's head. The girl crashed to the ground with a groan, clutching the growing lump on the top of her skull. What are you morants doing to my guild hall? Everyone froze, one by one slowly turning up towards to see Master Makarov glaring down at them from the second floor balcony. Urza looked around guiltily, she and Myra Jane had broken many tables and chairs smashing each other around, and some of the older guild members had positioned themselves off to the corners of the building, watching the spectacle. Not to mention she was still standing over the fallen Myra Jane, with a chair held over her head. There would be no ducking responsibility here. My apologies master, my were having a discussion and things got out of hand. Makarov snorted looking between Urza and Myra Jane, then at the chair in Urza's hands. The young knight followed his gaze, and then hastily put the chair down. That much is obvious. However, my question is why are you fighting someone who is visiting this guild? Urza hesitated for a moment, and Myra Jane took the opportunity to speak up. We aren't just visiting, we are trying to join up. I wanted to see how powerful some of the guild members were, See how you guys stack up. Oh ho, a challenge then. Tell me, what did you think? Myra looked around the guild, taking in the damages and the people gathered around her. A smirk graced her face as she looked back up towards the small man. Well, they all look like idiots, but at least they like to fight, one or two of them can even pack a punch. I think I can speak for my siblings when I saw that this is a place we can call home. I speak for myself though when I saw that I'm going to enjoy kicking Ms. Tin can around all the time. Makarov quickly raised his hand, cutting off Urza before she could retort. I'm sure you'll have plenty of time for that later, though I hope that while you are beating each other senseless, you at least attempt to develop some sort of friendship. Now what do you say we make it official, and give all three of you the mark of fairy tale? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
and thus it wasn't until the early afternoon that Makarov summoned the younger guild members to meet with him. Goku, Urza, Grey, Kana, Levi, and the Strauss siblings gathered together around the old man as he stood atop the bar. So, I hope everyone enjoyed the party last night. Especially since, thanks to certain members here, our food stores are almost completely gone. Makarov gazed around the group, letting out a small snicker at the sheepish cough that followed. Anyways, since you are all here I've decided to find you guys a little team-building exercise. There have been a reports of an unknown which terrorizing a small territory down south known as Camelot. Supposedly this witch has gathered a group of monsters and is terrorizing the town. We've been requested to send a group of five mags down there to take care of the situation. I've arranged things so that you will be picked up at the train station in town and driven out to the general area of the witch, that way you won't have to deal with the local ruler. Why do you not want us to deal with the local ruler? asked Urza, eyebrow raised. Normally when mags went to deal with a threat, the local leader would be the one they would contact. Makarov looked at them for a moment and then made a face. It wasn't just a scowl or frown. It was a grimace of utter disgust that perfectly showed his distaste for the subject at hand. Trust me kiddos. He replied, distaste dripping from his tone, you do not want to have to work with the local ruler. In the past I've sent people down to spend a day with him as my absolute worst form of punishment. This punishment has grown so hated over the years, everyone in the guild simply refers to it as that. Until such a time comes around that I actually need to resort to it, you won't have any interaction with him at all. The looks on all of the children varied in different levels of curiosity of fear on what exactly that was. Looking around, Urza was the one to bring up the next point of discussion. Excuse me master, you said that only five of us would be going. You have more of us here than you need. If we really only need five, then there is no real reason for our newer members to come along. Myra Jane threw her a look of disgust before throwing a retort. I don't see any real reason that you need to come along. The three of us already have a real powerful team on our own, I bet that we wouldn't even need five members to get the job done. If the other two are really necessary, then we'll take along the two boys. The stripper can keep our drinks. Cool, and I bet Dumbo makes for some good entertainment. Makarov looked down and moaned as the two strong-headed girls clashed once again. He expanded his hands to grab onto both girls, slamming them apart and holding them down. Well one thing is for sure, both of you are going on this mission. Working together, fighting to protect yourselves and those who fight besides you, with any luck you will develop a strong bond. The pair's cries of protest were quickly silenced as the master tightened his grasp, forcing the air from their lungs. No arguments, I both of you show true potential to become truly powerful as you mature, and I won't have you doing so as enemies. Now then, all we must do now is determine who will be accompanying you. Kana, I think you would be useful on this mission, we could use someone level-headed enough to potentially keep these two from killing each other. Kana squired in her seat, looking down nervously. Actually master, I was hoping to remain at the guild for the next few days. I heard that Gildartz is supposed to be back soon, and I was hoping to be able to see him. That is fine child, I thought that might be your answer. That's why I asked Levi to come here. Levi, would you be willing to fill in for Kana as the group mediator? I would master, but what about Goku? Urza and I were both working on helping him learn to read and write, it wouldn't be very productive to leave and just stop for now. Who knows how long we could be gone, he might end up forgetting everything before we are back. Very well then, Goku may go as well. His eyes shifted to look at the boy, now sporting a wide grin at the opportunity to go on another adventure. I expect you to continue to study hard while you are on the road boy, is that understood? Sure thing, this will be great. Mira Jane's look grew darker as the conversation continued until she finally burst out. What about Lee's Anna and Elfman? 
If we can only take five, that means that one of them can't come with us. Makarov looked over the two younger members of the trio, focusing mostly on Liz Anna. I'm sorry about this, but I'm not planning on letting Liz Anna go on any missions anytime soon. She is a bit younger than the children I normally take in, and while I'm sure you are all experienced, I do not want any accidents to take place. Elfman, you may go if you want, but your sister stays here. I don't like that, I know Myra can take care of herself, but I don't want to leave Liz Anna by herself. If she isn't going, then I won't be either. Myra Jane opened her mouth to retort, but Elfman was quick to cut her off. You're the strongest of us Myra, you can do things we can't. One day I want to be strong enough that I can always protect you both, but for now I can only protect Liz Anna. When we have proven ourselves we will all go together again, but for now we all need to develop our abilities so that we can always have each other's backs. Myra gave a soft smile at her brother, giving him a short but warm hug. All right bro, you hold down the fort for me, make sure our little sis is safe. I'll take care of this big bad witch, and I'll bring you guys both an awesome story and a souvenir from the trip. Makarov nodded at the pair before turning to face Grey. That leaves you as the last member of this adventure. I trust that you have no urgent matter to take care of outside of finding your shirt. Gray looked down and gritted his teeth to contain a string of curses. He quickly grabbed Kana from her chair and dashed off. Makarov gave a hearty chuckle as the two began crawling around searching under tables. All right then everyone, the plan is set, and you leave at noon tomorrow. Until then rest up and back your bags, you are all in for quite the trip. Like and subscribe for more.